What do people worry about for the American reactor? You're not going to have a carbon fire. Probably, you're not going to have a reactivity accident. Reactivity is when it starts getting hotter and it gets worse because it has a negative reactivity. If this thing overheats, it tends to slow down the nuclear reaction. So what do people worry about? They came up with a, what they call the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. And the worst that anybody can, uh, can come up with is a nuclear meltdown. And let me show you how the meltdown works. This is the idea. Somehow, a pipe breaks, and you develop a leak in the reactor. And this water all flows out. What's the first thing that happens when the water flows out? The chain reaction stops. Why does the chain reaction stop? Because there's no moderator. Without a moderator, the chain reaction... So the first thing that will happen in this worst case scenario is the chain reaction stops. So the radioactivity continues on. Now, once the water is all drained, these things are full of radioactive particles. So what happens with them? Well, they're hot because they're radioactive. The water was cooling them. In fact, that radioactivity contributes to the heating of the water. This water is made hot, and that's what goes and runs the turbines, the hot water. The, the chain reaction is used to heat water. So the water runs a turbine. That's how a nuclear reactor works. So what happens when the water is all gone? You're left with the fuel. The fuel gets hot. It might melt. So. They put in a very carefully designed emergency core cooling system. This is called the core, core cooling system. And that cools it off, so there's no problem. Well, if there's no problem, then this is not the worst case scenario. So therefore, let's assume the emergency, emergency core cooling system fails. Well, we're trying to get the worst case. What's the probability it will fail? Well, you can calculate that. It's infinitesimal. But, you know, people make mistakes in these calculations. They don't realize things. So let's do the worst case scenario. By the way, I believe in the nuclear industry, that's the only industry in which we require a worst case scenario. You have to assume that everything fails and then ask what happens. We don't do this in the chemical industry. Worst case scenario in a chemical industry. You know, a truck full of chlorine driving right through a populated area of New York City and crashes and the fumes come out. Every now and then you see a train crash. And they evacuate the nearby cities because the trains carried chlorine or something like that. But nobody analyzes worst case scenarios. But in the nuclear industry, they do. People are beginning to catch on to this. And so now there's a movement among those of us who are truly worried about greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide, which we'll be talking more about later in the semester, to that, that maybe nuclear power is actually much safer for, for us than, than gasoline and coal. And so there's some nice op-ed pieces by Nicholas Kristof, for example, a rather liberal columnist, entitled, Nuclear is Green. So they, they, there may be a mood shift in this. But let's go on with the worst case scenario. So therefore, the water's gone, the emergency core cooling system fails, this stuff just heats up. What happens when it heats up? Well, it, it will melt. So nothing's working, this stuff will melt, it'll dribble down and form a little puddle on the bottom. Now, this stuff has rather thick steel. I forget exactly how thick it is. I think maybe a, a foot or two of, of steel. And it's inspected all the time to make sure there are no cracks and things. But worst case scenario, let's say this pool happens to accumulate in a nice small area, and it melts its way through and, and dribbles out the bottom. What happens then? Well, this whole thing is surrounded by a concrete containment building made of reinforced concrete. I forget, again, exactly how thick that is. I used to know these numbers. Uh, but it's probably you know, eight feet thick or something like that. Uh, Chernobyl had no containment building. None. This has the steel, and then it has the concrete. So it gets to the bottom. It should spread out and cool off. But what if it doesn't spread out? What if it somehow manages, worst case scenario, to come down and work its way through the containment building? The gases can still escape. And there are some gases that can escape and lead to bad levels of radioactivity if that happens. So this is what people analyze. This is called the nuclear meltdown. But this gas can escape and, and spread over the countryside, and it's a bad amount of radioactivity. Is it as much as Chernobyl? Oh, no, nowhere near as much as Chernobyl. Why not? 
Well, first of all, it's only the gases that get out. The gas rest gets into the ground. Oh, that might get into the groundwater. Yeah, but the difference between getting into the groundwater and, and having come and smoke and cover the city. So this worst case scenario is not nearly as bad as Chernobyl. Chernobyl was, was worse than we can imagine possibly happening with a decent design. Once you've had this thing operating for a year or two, these things are full of radioactive fission fragments. The ones that decay right away, those are fine. They give you more heat. You use that heat to heat the water and run the reactor. But after a while, you're left with the things that live for you know, 50, 80 years, something like strontium-90. And that's not decaying enough. And you've used up your uranium, so you pull out the rods and put in fresh uranium. You've used up most of the uranium, and the decay heat isn't doing you much good. So what do you have now? You have a rod that's full of plutonium and fission fragments. So what do you do with this? Well, many people, like in France, think the right thing to do is you take the plutonium and you separate it out. That's called reprocessing. And then the plutonium can also be used in a nuclear reactor. It's a, it's a fuel. You, you, you put plutonium in instead of, of uranium. And so uh, that's what many countries do. We decided back uh, 30 years ago not to do that. Instead, this plutonium stuff would be considered waste. And so we decided we would bury it instead of reprocessing it. Why did we decide this? It, it, if you go back into history, I've tried to figure this out. And there are people who will tell me and give me their opinions. Uh, but I think the reason was that in those days, uranium was cheap weren't about to run out. Plutonium had a bad name. People thought it was far more dangerous than it really is. And of course, you could make bombs out of it. There was discussion back in those days of something that was called the plutonium economy. There would be so much plutonium around from reprocessing that people would start using it maybe to heat their homes or something like that. And there was a very strong reaction against this. We did not want to go to a future that had a plutonium economy. And so it was declared that we would not reprocess. Instead, we would keep it as waste. Because waste is no problem. You just bury it underground. These days, there's a great political uproar against burying plutonium underground. Why? Because it has a half-life of 24,000 years. So it'll keep on decaying for 24,000 years and even longer. That's only its half-life. And so now they don't want to, there are people who object to burying the waste. There's a special place in Nevada called Yucca Mountain, which was a place that has fewer earthquakes than almost anywhere else, Yucca Mountain. They build these tunnels underground to store this stuff, and now people are objecting. It's, it's not safe enough to put it there unless you can guarantee its safety for 24,000 years. And hey, you know, by that time, the Democrats will be back in charge of the White House or something. I don't know. 24,000 years, how can you guarantee that? Therefore, you shouldn't put it in Yucca Mountain. My reaction is, ah, what do you mean you shouldn't put it there? So where are you going to leave it? We have this waste. You know where it's sitting? It's sitting next to the nuclear reactors in a separate building. And one of the things I was most worried about is not a terrorist going after the nuclear reactor, but a terrorist going after these temporary waste, uh, waste sites that are right next to the nuclear reactor. Why? Because it's not safe enough to bury them a mile underground. So let's leave them in a building next to the nuclear reactor. And people say, no, neither of them are good solutions. But the stuff doesn't go away. So you need to put it somewhere. And I, I you know, I, I, what about transporting it? Is there a danger in transporting it? Interesting story there. Because what they decided to do was they decided to make it so safe in the transportation that nobody would worry about that. Now, the, the people here who are in psychology may appreciate this story. If you decide you're going to make it so safe that nobody will worry about it, you wind up really frightening people. What they do is they put in these big concrete containers on big trucks. And it's so safe that you could blow it up with dynamite. And the truck will be destroyed, but the container sits there undamaged. They prove this. So what do they do? They have a nice cliff, and they take the truck full of this nuclear waste, and they drive it off the cliff. They, full the, they, they even load the truck with dynamite and gasoline so that as if it was sabotaged in some way. This thing goes crashing down to the ground. The thing blows up in a big fireball, and there is the undamaged container. The public sees this, and they go crazy. They associate death, destruction, explosions, everything with nuclear waste. Nobody wants explosions like that in their highway, in their town. <laughs> so 
the psychology was done completely wrong. And as a result, there's a great uproar now against transporting it for, for just that reason. <laughs>